speaking to me. And that was, make the woeful heart to sing. Make the woe-filled heart to sing. I don't know what's in your heart this morning. I don't know what uh, woes you may be filled with. Uh, But I trust that as we've had a chance to express ourselves in song and as we have heard the word of God read this morning, uh, that any woes that you carry, I trust, will be lightened and that you will sense the presence of the God and the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. There was just uh, one prayer request uh, that didn't make it into the bulletin, and I just uh, share it with you. Some of you have heard of the uh, fires in Tennessee that are going, and we have some connections uh, to them. Some of you are, have been around long enough. You remember Ron and Karen Cook, and they are in that area where the flames are. And likewise, uh, Alan Marilyn Litweiler's uh, daughter, Shelly, and her, her uh, husband, Chris, they have a vacation home that's in harm's way. And then also Della Rice's uh, daughter, Randy, and her family, they, in fact, were evacuated from their home uh, just within the last uh, several days. And so we want to pray for them. Let, let's do that uh, this morning as we go to the Word. Father, we, we think of uh, just that phrase, Father, we have woeful hearts at times. Father, we feel that uh, we carry burdens. Uh, but Father, we just thank you that in Christ, in the knowledge of your love for us, your presence with us, that we can, even in those woe-filled moments, we can sing and we can praise in the midst of the storm. Father, thank you for that reminder. Father, we do thank you and we do think of those who are uh, just... Uh, Watching the weather, watching the smoke, watching perhaps the flames within their field of vision. Father, we would ask that you would protect those. Father, especially those that uh, we have mentioned this morning. We ask that you would uh, just preserve life. Father, preserve property. Father, we just pray that you would bring that uh, fire, those fires under control. And Father, we just pray that uh, uh, you would be gracious in that. Father, too, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word this morning. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. Father, may we approach it as such. Father, not uh, approaching it as fable or legend or myth or mystery, but, Father, approaching it as truth. Father, may we hear it, may we understand it, and may we respond to it in a way that brings glory to you. In honor to Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we've sung those words, Fairest Lord Jesus. And that's a song I've been singing all my life, and probably many of you have been singing that as well through many years. And and as I was thinking about that this this past week, to my shame, I've really never thought about what I was saying. Fairest Lord Jesus, what does that mean? And I thought, well, it could mean that when Jesus plays Uno, he doesn't cheat, right? He doesn't try to put down a couple cards at the time, like some of you may be apt to do. Or it could mean that Jesus is maybe not outstanding, maybe he's okay, like he's fair to Midland. You know, somewhere in there, fairest Lord Jesus. Or it could mean that he is of white complexion. He's fair. He's prone to sunburn like some of us. I doubt that's the case because growing up in the Middle East of his descent, he would have been more dark in skin. So, so it doesn't mean that. So, so what does it mean when we sing those words, fairest Lord Jesus? Well, I, I think as you look through the, the hymn itself, and especially as you come to the fourth stanza, It begins, beautiful Savior. When when we're talking about the fairness of Jesus, the fairest Lord Jesus, we're talking about his beauty, the beauty of Jesus Christ. It was Jonathan Edwards who wrote this about the beauty of Christ. The beauty of Christ is revealed in his character. His love for his people. His atonement and resurrection and his present and future reign. 
In this regard, the vast majority of people in the world today, they, they fail to see the beauty of Jesus. And they simply overlook him or they look past him as if he weren't there. As if he had nothing to offer, as if he is of little consequence or significance to us. And this looking past and overlooking Jesus is nothing new. In fact, it was foretold by the prophet Isaiah many centuries ago. Last week we heard God introduce his, his servant. Behold, my servant. Let's get to know him. And we, we did that. And when what we discovered about God's servant last week was that he would be glorified. That he would be grief stricken. We discovered that he would be grace giving. And that he would be gasp inducing. And we're told that when this servant makes his appearance and comes to earth to bring salvation, rather than being overjoyed at his coming, the response of most people will be simply to overlook him or to look past him. Well, how can this be? That's what the first three verses of Isaiah chapter 53 tell us as we look once again to the gospel in the Old Testament as we look at the good old news. And this is where we start this morning. God's servant was overlooked by most people when he came to earth on his God-given mission. Most people didn't see his significance. They saw him of little consequence. And so they looked past him and overlooked him. Well, in these three verses, I want you to notice with me three reasons why he was overlooked. Why he was viewed by some as to be of little significance when he did visit our planet. Let's take a look at that this morning. First of all, notice with me that God's servant was overlooked because he seemed weak rather than strong. Weak rather than strong or powerful. Our text begins... Who has believed what he has heard from us? Or who has believed our message or our report about him? What was it that had been told to the people which so few were able to believe? What had been told to them which so people were, were able to find, or so few people were able to find credible? Well, just what we saw last week. God's servant will be glorified above all others. Everyone could agree with that. Certainly, when God's servant comes to earth, he should be glorified. So, so that was to be expected. But God's servant will be stricken with grief and suffering. What? Well, that's not at all what we would expect from the servant of God, right? And then we're told that, that he will cleanse... He will sprinkle, he will take away the sins of many nations. And if you were a Jew hearing that, you would think, hey, it is fine for God's servant to come to us, the Israelites, the Jewish nation. But what's this all nations stuff? That would have got the attention and that would have been easily dismissed. Surely not. That's not what the servant of God, that's not what the deliverer was to do. So consequently, few initially believed that they'd, what they heard about him, the report that was given about him. But that wasn't the worst of it. As it goes on, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now this sentence could be paraphrased or translated. Who could have believed that this was the arm of the Lord? Who could have believed that this one was coming, or who came, would actually be the arm of the Lord? Now, what does it mean to be the arm of the Lord? The arm of the Lord is a figure that's used throughout the Old Testament scriptures as a symbol of God's power, of his strength. We read of God, his arm, his strength being revealed in creation. And, and, and it's... The arm of the Lord, it's... How many of you have a box of Arm & Hammer? 
in your freezer, your refrigerator, your cupboard. Well, what's the picture on it? Yeah, and a hammer, I believe. And it's a flexed muscle. That is a symbol of the power of Arm and Hammer baking soda. It'll get the job done. Well, God got the job done by his mighty power, by his arm in creation. But also we're told in the Old Testament that God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt by the power of his arm. And we're told again that God would flex his muscle once again in the last days when he would deliver mankind. That there was going to come a day where God would send his deliverer, his servant, and his servant would flex his muscle and show his power to bring freedom once again. Such is the case, it was told in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. We read there, the Lord has bared his holy arm. The, the Lord is flexed his muscle. This, this, the tense of this verb is a prophetic perfect verb. And it makes it sound like something that is yet to happen has already happened because it is certain to happen. As if it already happened. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of his God. God is going to flex his muscle through his servant and deliver all mankind. But the servant of the Lord who would bring deliverance and salvation by all appearances, he wasn't up to the task. How could the one described in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 14 ever possess the power and the strength necessary to deliver anyone from anything? They would look on him. And say, well, certainly not. This is no deliverer. But appearances can be deceiving, can't they? Our son Brad, when he was, I think it was a freshman in college, he, he went to uh, spring break uh, to Miami with a couple friends. One, a, a friend from up in the Wheaton area. The other was a young man that became his roommate for a couple years. He was from Bolivia. His name was Nico. The, the thing about Nico was, even though he was born and bred Bolivian, he was Caucasian. His mother tongue was Spanish. So one night, they're in Miami, and they went to a hibachi grill. Now, you know how a hibachi grill is. You, you sit around while people, while the chef, you know, cuts your food and makes the volcano and does all that stuff, right in front of you. And, and there was Nico and Brad, his other friend. And then there was another group at the table sharing the space with them, and they were Hispanic. And throughout the meal, Brad's table guests, the other ones, they were speaking in Spanish and making comments about those stupid Americans sharing the table with them. You know, oh, they eat too fast, and oh, they have no manners, and oh, this, and oh, that. And, and so they ate, and Brad and his friends, they got done. And as they were going away, Nico turns to them. And in perfect Spanish, says, be careful what you say. You never know who may be listening. It's not kind to be so rude. <laughs> Things aren't always as they appear. Those who appear to be English speakers may well be Spanish speakers. And those who appear to be weak may well be strong. Appearances can be deceiving. The majority of people who determine that, who determine that the servant of God doesn't present, possess the power and strength necessary to deliver them, they would pass him by and they would overlook him because they saw nothing in him that said power to deliver, power to save. So the servant of God was overlooked because he seemed weak rather than strong, but also because 
he seemed ordinary rather than majestic. The text continues. For he, the servant of God, grew up before him, the servant of God grew up before God like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. Young plant. That's a very specific, we're not just talking about little plants in your garden that you plant. It was a very specific type of plant or thing that grew on another plant. It, when I was growing up, one of, we had two big maple trees, one on each side of our driveway. And every year, starting midsummer or so, these little branches would start growing up from the base, right? Do you remember that? Uh, you, you remember those? They're called suckers. And it was my job to take the pruning shears and to cut those suckers off of the tree. They you didn't want to leave them because they looked ugly and because they robbed nutrients from the tree. They had to go. Well, this is exactly what the word young plant means. The servant of God, when he came, he would be like a young plant, like a sucker. You know, a nuisance. Nothing attractive. Something that has to go. Something that didn't look good. To many who looked upon the servant of God, that would be all they would see. That young sucker that had to go. But, but not only that, he, he would be like a root out of dry ground. Now, now what grows great in dry ground? Well, generally, you get out of dry ground, plants that are spindly or unhealthy, like the front of your bulletin this morning, that's a desert, and there's, you know, there's nothing really attractive growing in that desert, is there, on that picture? And not only plants are unhealthy and spindly, but weeds, they do grow in dry ground, right? So would be God's servant. All He would have all the allure of a sucker and a weed. Normal things, but nothing of value. And beyond that, he had no form or majesty that we'd look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. There would simply be nothing in God's servant appearance that would set him apart from anyone else. The people of Israel, they were looking for majesty. They were looking for a king to come and deliver them. And this one that came, the servant of God, when he came, he was none of that. His, his form, we saw that last week, that his form, his shape was marred so that they couldn't even, through his suffering, tell if this is human, if he is human. And here his form, there, there was nothing in his form, nothing in his shape, nothing in the way he carried himself, which would set him apart from others. Nothing in his stature or bearing was kingly or charismatic or eye-catching. Nothing set him apart. There was a popular saying, I tried to find the origin of it, but I, I, I couldn't. But uh, especially in years past, you used to hear this, you either have it or you don't. And whatever it is, you know it when you see it. And the servant of God, when he would come, it would be determined that he doesn't have it. He would be seen far too ordinary to bring the past, the deliverance which mankind was looking for. And so people would, for the most part, overlook him when he came to bring salvation. He didn't fit the mold. He didn't have the shape he didn't have the form of what people thought a deliverer would look like. And so, in their error, they overlooked him. Because he seemed so ordinary and not majestic at all. But, but not only that, God's servant was overlooked because he seemed 
worthless rather than valuable. People saw in him more trash than treasure. Between verse 2 and verse 3, there, there's a change of tone regarding the servant of God. The one who would bring salvation to mankind. Up till now, we get the idea that God's servant would be overlooked. People simply didn't see anything significant or special about him. They would think poorly about him. Rather, they, And they found it easy to look right past or look right through him. But that changes in verse 3. Now we're told that God's servant will not merely be overlooked, but that he will be looked at, but people will undervalue that which they see. Now people are going to, they're, they're just not going to ignore him. And the, the, the servant of God who's coming is going to start to attract attention. And people will begin to cast their gaze upon him. But they didn't like what they see. He was despised and rejected by men. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Two times we're told that God's servant will be despised. Now I, I learned this past week that there's a different nuance between our English use of the word despised and the Hebrew meaning of the word despise. In, in English, when we despise something, there, there is a, a very great deal of emotion in that word. To despise a person carries that, that emotion. We, we evaluate a person, and if our evaluation of a person is negative, we hold that person in contempt. We have an emotional response to that person. They make us sick to our stomach. Oh, they turn our... They, they just do something within us. And that's English. But, but Hebrew, it sort of loses or lacks that emotional component. In, in Hebrew, the word despise simply means to make an evaluation. And, and so you listen to what a person has to say. You give a person a hearing... You consider what they have to say, and then based on the information, you draw your conclusion, whether that person has anything of value to add to your life or not. He was despised, he was evaluated, and for the most part, he was rejected. They listened to him, and they determined that he didn't have anything to add to their life. Recall... John chapter 6. Jesus is being flocked. People are following him left and right. And then he says some things and all of a sudden the, the, the big crowd is gone and all is left are his 12 apostles. <laughs> the, they were the only ones that saw value in him. They were the only ones who evaluated him and didn't reject him. In the servant's case, most people would make their evaluation of him and reject him, believing that he had nothing of value to offer. And twice, as a means of emphasizing the point, we're told that he would be evaluated. He was despised and rejected by men. He was despised and we esteemed him not. As said in another context, mankind, the people who encountered the servant of God, he would be weighed in the balance and found wanting. So many would simply walk away from him, not seeing anything in him of relevance or importance to their life. We, and the prophet here is identifying himself with the Hebrew nation, and speaking corporately, we generally esteemed him not. We didn't see anything of value within him. Well, why would they draw that conclusion? Well, because he would seem to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
the, the servant of God who would become, who would come, who was to be the deliverance, he would be, have a life filled with woe, as we just sing about. He would live a woe-filled life. People looked at him, and when they looked at Jesus and they looked what happened to him, they would conclude that he, can, he gives the appearance of being not someone who is the recipient of God's blessing, but he would appear to be someone who was living out his life under God's curse. Someone whose life was so woeful, so woe-filled. How could that person be the servant of God? Servants of God there won't suffer, will they? There'll be no grief in their life, will there? And so they turned away, believing it was safe to turn away, that it was wise to turn away and look for someone else. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. They, they turn away, looking for another deliverer, looking for for someone else of value. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone who gave you the impression that even as you were talking to them, their eyes seemed to be scanning the room looking for someone more interesting to talk with? <laughs> Have you ever done that? You're in conversation and the person you're talking with, you realize they're not looking at me, they're looking past me. That doesn't feel good, does it? I've probably done it, so I won't be too hard on, you know, sometimes you got to looking for someone specific or some, uh, thing you, someone you need to talk with about a certain thing. Um, but, but if you're in a conversation with someone like that, who, who you know is looking past you, you feel pretty devalued in that conversation. Well, that would be the experience of God's servant. He would come under scrutiny. People would give him a hearing and then they would reject him, concluding that he was of someone of no significance to them. And even as they overlooked him, and even as they were looking past them, they would be looking for someone more deserving of their attention. God's servant was to come to earth, and would come to earth to provide salvation Yet he would be overlooked by most people. The, the vast majority would overlook God's servant. They wouldn't be able to see him for who he was because they couldn't get past his apparent weakness. They, they couldn't get past his ordinariness. And their perception of him was that he lacked value for them personally. And what was prophesied in 700 B.C. came to pass in 33 A.D., didn't it? The Apostle John opens his gospel by introducing us to one who would come from God. And in fact would be God. In order for his readers to come to grips with the value of this one who was coming, so that people would not overlook him, he identifies him as the word, as the fullest and most immediate expression of God to mankind. The word became flesh. God became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us so that we could know what God is like. And, and, and so he came as the word. He's identified as the word. And he's identified this one that was coming, the servant of God who would come, is, would be the light of men. He would shine the truth of God to men so that men could come into relationship with God, the one who is light. The one who would come would point the way to God. For all of mankind. Still, when the word of God came, when the light of men came, when the servant of God came, he was overlooked. He was in the world. He was on planet Earth. And the world was made through him. He was the creator. Yet, the world, now we're not talking about the planet. Now we're talking about the people on the planet. Even though the world, the creation, and the people on the planet were made through him, yet the world, the people on the planet, did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own people did not receive him. 
They did not recognize who he was. They looked at him, and then they overlooked him, and then they looked past him, looking for yet another Messiah and Savior. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to all who did believe, Those who believed in his name. Those who saw him as the word made flesh. Those who saw him as the light of men. Those who saw him as the promised servant of God who would come to earth to bring cleansing and forgiveness. To all who believed in his name. He, this one so overlooked, This one so ordinary. This one who apparently was so weak. This one who was more trash than treasure. He, Jesus Christ, gave the right to become children of God. To enter into relationship with the creator God. The writer of Ecclesiastes was correct. There is nothing new under the sun. People failed to see Jesus the Savior for who he was. They just couldn't come to grips with who he was. And likewise, still many today cannot see his power, but only his weakness. And many people yet today, they fail to see his majesty, but only see his rather ordinariness. And many people today don't see his value, but only their perception of his worthlessness to them personally. He was overlooked. Seemingly weak. Seemingly ordinary. Seemingly trash, not treasure. So as we conclude, let's consider, have you overlooked Jesus? Are you looking past him? Believing that he has nothing to offer you. Here's my challenge. Here's my prayer. Look again. Look again to see the glory of Jesus. Uh, A second question. Have have you grown frustrated with God's ways? He, He doesn't come through for me. The servant of God reminds us that God often works in unexpected ways. God's way of doing things may often make little sense to us. How could a king, how could a deliverer, how could the servant of God be born in a stable and not in a palace? That seems so odd. Maybe you're feeling this morning that, that Jesus isn't coming through for me. And to you, I just say, hang on. The last chapter isn't written. The the end of the story hasn't come. Recall, as Isaiah says later on, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. When your circumstances tempt you to look away from Jesus and to hide your face from him, may you instead choose to look at him and to continue trusting to him and clinging to him. Have you felt that Jesus is too up there to relate to you down here? Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Man, he's, he's up there in heaven and I'm there on earth and he has no idea what I'm going through. Now remember, he was a man of sorrow, well acquainted with grief. His was in many ways a woe-filled And so he understands. And he can relate to whatever it is you are going through at this very moment. David Jeremiah has written, Jesus can relate to us on a very personal level when we're dealing with pain and grief. If you are in a time of sadness and sorrow and feel that no one understands you, 
Remember that Jesus understands because he has experienced pain too. He has been wherever you are and will walk with you through your darkest hour. Now remember that. When the circumstances of your life come and you think, does Jesus care? And you conclude, no, he doesn't. Because he's up there and I'm down here. Now remember, man of sorrow. We have a great high priest, one representing us before the very throne of God, who knows exactly what we are going through, knows the sorrow and the grief of a woe-filled world. And he says, come, come to me. And in his presence, we will find help and grace in our time of need. Are you overlooking Jesus? Many did. Well, I trust that none of us would be in that camp this morning. We look to Jesus, and we do see his power. We speak Jesus with a powerful name. And we see his majesty. And his majesty... We recognize that he is the deliverer and that he is treasure. And it was with the precious lamb of God, the precious blood of the lamb that saves us from sin. May we not look past him. May we not look through him. But may we look to him. Let's pray to that end. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that that which was prophesied was fulfilled. But Father, we thank you that not everybody looked past Jesus when he was on earth. Thank you that not everybody looks past him today. Though the vast majority may, Father, we thank you for those who turn their eyes upon Jesus. and Don't hide their face from him, but look into his wonderful face. And there find forgiveness. There find salvation. There find strength to help us through each and every day. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your servant, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, may he be exalted in us, by us, and through us to a watching world. Father, this is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The chorus simply says, Alleluia, which means praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. He's my Savior. I pray that that's what every one of us can say this morning. If you can't say that this morning, then, then take care of that yet today. That we can say, He's my Savior. And within the deepest part of our heart, we'll be able to say, he is worthy. We understand, he's not trash, but he is treasure, and he's my treasure. And as a result, as the chorus says, I will praise him. Would you stand as we sing those words together?
thy Savior. He is worthy. And we will praise him. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Go in peace. Thank you.